Welcome to this new global public lecture series, Decolonizing Law, exploring the relationships between law, race, imperialism, colonialism, anti-imperialism, and de-anti-post-colonialism. I'm Ralph Wilde from UCL. I'm delighted to introduce this lecture series, which offers a stellar all-women lineup of amazing speakers. Today's lecturer, Vasuki Nasaya, and following Vasuki, Liliana Obregon, Mindy Chen Wishart, Tendai Achumi, Asla Bali, Aicha Chubutsku, Fabia Fernandez Cavallo, Amaya Alves, and Vidya Kumar. Today, Vidya will be speaking, uh, Vasuki will be speaking about colonial reparations. Future lectures will address international law in the Americas, racism and universities, the intersections between critical race theory and third world approaches to international law, decolonizing the idea of humanity, intervention in Latin America, nature rights and the Chilean constitution, and revolution in international law. Everyone is welcome to attend live and recordings of most of the lectures will be posted online on the website for the lectures. I'd like to offer my warmest thanks to my fantastic colleagues, Lisa Penfold, Jessica Luong, and Danielle McFarlane at UCL Laws for their outstanding work setting up the practicalities of and the publicity for these lectures. Lisa, Jess, and Danielle, I'm very grateful to you. Today's speaker is my dear friend, Vasuki Nasaya. I first met Vasuki almost 20 years ago when we were brought together on a research project headed by Hilary Charlesworth. I was then and have been ever since blown away by the sheer force of Vasuki's intellect. This combined with her highly original ideas makes her one of the most important thinkers globally in the field of international law today. Vasuki is a founding member of the Third World Approaches to International Law Twail Collective and Academic Tradition. She's Professor of Human Rights and International Law at the Gallatin School at NYU. Her current projects include two monographs in progress, International Conflict Feminism, and Reading the Ruins, Slavery, Colonialism, and International Law. She's also co-editing a book entitled Twail, a Handbook, with Anthony Angi, B.S. Chimney, and Michael Thackeray and Karen Mickelson. Masuki's talk today is entitled Debt, International Law, and Reparations. Masuki, I'm delighted you're here. And greatly looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much, uh, Ralph, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be the warm up act for such a stellar uh, series, um, and um, I feel quite privileged. Uh, Lisa, thanks for taking care of all the logistical arrangements for this event. Um, I'm really, very glad to be here, even if it's on um, Zoom. Um, okay, so without further preambles, let me turn to the paper. Um, it makes two principal interventions. Firstly, that the doctrine of odious debt becomes a way of making reparative claims for debt refusal legally legible. My second intervention, one that I try to perform in this piece, is really about how we read international law. The doctrine of odious debt, I argue, is a hook for a heterodox reparative reading practice, reading for interruption, one might say. Okay, so let me get on with it. If we're looking out to sea from the beaches of Haiti in April 1825, a dozen French warships may have been visible on the horizon. Some 20 years after France was defeated by the 1804 Haitian Revolution, France remained insistent on relitigating that loss in the domain of international law, great power diplomacy, and naval power. Carried to the Caribbean Sea by the winds of the Interimperial Alliances sealed at the Congress of Vienna, those warships were the backdrop 
to France's demand for recognition money from the Haitian president, Jean-Pierre Boyer. France and her allies would not grant recognition to the Haitian revolution and recognize Haitian sovereignty unless Haiti agreed to pay France the princely sum of 150 million francs as indemnity for the financial loss incurred by Imperial France and French slaveholders as a result of Haitian emancipation. If the French Revolution was fought with the promise of liberty, equality, and fraternity, the racial caveats to those promissory notes were clarified in Santo Domingo. To render itself visible to the world, earn recognition as a free and independent sovereign, and birth itself in the eyes of international law, Haiti was coerced into contorting itself into a debtor nation. This required asserting Haitian sovereignty in the very act that corroded it, namely accepting the terms of the extortion as debt undertaken by a free and independent nation. In this way, France's demands for indemnity shifted from the hypervisibility of the warships to become the ever-present, but also ever-backgrounded foundation of Haiti's post-1825 future as a sovereign nation. Notwithstanding the 1804 revolution, it is the act of assuming indebted status that is the process that births Haiti's sovereignty as a universal category that earns recognition in the society of nation. Thus the indemnity that was imposed by the warships and what they represented translates into international law ledgers as a debt that sovereign Haiti owed to sovereign France through this paradoxical performative constitutive structure. In fact, Haiti incurred further debt to keep up payments even after the total amount was renegotiated to 90 million francs. Haiti finally paid the principal indemnity six decades later in 1893 and settled all accounts, including related interest payments in 1947. There was a world of difference that interrupted what Robin Kelly refers to as freedom dreams between 1804 and 1825, between revolutionary Haiti and post-colonial Haiti. The impact of these payments on Haiti have been catastrophic. If the warships of 1825 manifestly threatened a violent massacre, the indemnity stealthily produced an equally brutal slow violence punishment for Haiti's revolutionary aspirations. As Western Lee Akhanat, the Haitian scholar noted, the French indemnity crippled the Haitian state and civil society. It intensified an already predatory state and accelerated the vulnerability of the economic infrastructure, easing the floodgates for foreign exploitation. There have been calls for reparations from Haiti for that catastrophic impact. At the very minimum, the calls have been for restitution of the money paid in terms of their current monetary value. As we discuss further below, these stand alongside other calls for rewriting current sovereign debt as reparations. The focus of this paper is to look at alternative international legal frameworks for debt severance as reparations, and to analyze what such an alternative framing entails and what is at stake. Dominant readings of international law celebrate its provisions for victims' right to reparations. Situated within the international human rights framework, the recognition of a right to reparation in response to human rights violations is often framed in terms of international law's promise for progress including its capacity for generating and buttressing norms, laws, and institutions that provide ameliorative closure on these histories of atrocity. Indeed, it is often a piece with the reading of atrocity as itself arising from a violation of the rule of law, rather than being symptomatic of the rules of the game. Reparations framed in human rights terms can often focus on events disconnected from their enabling conditions and their structural work or maldistributive impact. Often these processes interpolate potential reparation claimants' political subjectivity as ones that fit within narrowly drawn human rights parameters. In many cases, this might also contribute to an individualized and non-systematic understanding of perpetrators, victims, and the social relations and world systems within which they are embedded. In these and other ways, reparation policies could unfold as interventions that deter, distract, um, or substitute for socioeconomic transformation. Against the backdrop of their dominant narrative, this paper probes how the demand for the severance of sovereign debt can be an entry point that seeks to refuse and interrupt 
rather than ameliorate and close the books. The human rights framing of reparations is in the key of repair and the restoration of the status quo. In contrast, I want to mine the archives of international law to consider interventions that might denaturalize that status quo and advance an alternative analysis of the political economy of international law and the ongoing legacies of a world order forged in the crucible of colonialism, slavery, and capitalism. With Haiti as my entry point into this conversation, I want to suggest that the concept of odious debt is a generative lens through which to rewrite the contract between Haiti and France, or we might say between Haiti and the international community, because that contract was inextricably tethered to the histories of colonization, slavery, and a racial capitalist world order. In public international law, the concept of odious debt speaks to how debt contracts might be legitimately breached because they were not negotiated by legitimate representatives. In an argument that is provisional rather than propositional, I explore if the concept of odious debt could provide a potential fruitful strategy of legal argumentation in support of the Haitian and CARICOM demands for debt severance. If debt was a price for a formal recognition of Haitian sovereignty, Odious debt might be seen as a recognition that the international norms, laws, and institutions that sustain the debt regime are directed at odious purposes that render the contract unenforceable. This framing underscores the mythos that lies behind the notion that post-colonial sovereignty is predicated on self-inflected wounds. Rather, the wounding is accomplished by an international system that enforces that contract. I want to draw out the concept of odious debt in international law and probe the interruptive potential of this reading as an alternative framing of reparations claims. The legal category of debt functions like the angling of a camera to steer our attention in one direction rather than another by operating on two intertwined registers of presence and visibility. On the one hand, the coercion that engenders and sustains sovereign debt makes its economic, military, and geopolitical presence felt as ever-present background conditions. And on the other, debt works to focus our attention on the obligations of the indebted rather than on that coercive world order. This dynamic has provided the scaffolding for the political horizon of independent Haiti, where responsibilities attached to debt are written as an indicator of Haiti's sovereign agency even while it is precisely the vehicle for ever greater sovereign dependence. Alcanat recounts how dependence on loans from American financiers to pay the French debt also opened the door for US intervention in Haitian affairs that continues today. The sovereignty that was recognized in that 1825 contract was one that invited more warships to its shores, both ones that were visible and ones that moved with the stealth of background rules of a racial capitalist order. Refusing those warships risks even that feeble and enfeebling sovereignty that was birthed in the 1825 agreement. For instance, in 2003, two centuries after the Haitian Revolution, Jean Bertrand Aristide, then president of Haiti, asked for a return of the indemnity funds, $21 billion in restitution when the sums were translated into their value in 2003. The demand was seen as a step towards another transition a transition from neo-colonial oppression into a new kind of sovereign agency. France was hostile to Aristide's demands for repayment. Moreover, like in 1825, France was able to marshal its allies to backstop France's position. Thus the metaphorical warship sailed into visibility again with guns already raised ready to fire. Thus in 2004, there was a coup against Aristide and the US and France collaborated on forcibly removing him from Haiti. A post Aristide Haiti was born and the ships once again discreetly sailed beyond the line of sight of Haiti's political horizon. Haitian sovereignty was restored and today Haitian national debt is almost $4 billion, almost half of its GDP. The Haitian call for restitution of the indemnity funds is an important adjunct to the demands advanced by Haiti as part of the 15 country Caribbean community, CARICOM, plan for reparatory justice. CARICOM situates a death cycle as an inheritance of slavery and colonialism, arguing that this death cycle property belong, properly belongs to the imperial governments who have made no sustained attempt to deal with debilitating colonial legacies. Support for the payment of domestic debt and cancellation of international debt are necessary reparatory actions, they say. 
The call for rewriting sovereign debt is one point in CARICOM's 10 point plan for reparative justice. The plan is directed at Europe for its responsibilities for colonialism and slavery in the region. Implicit in this vision is an analysis of how histories of colonialism and slavery are windows to the past, but also constitutive of the present. They mark the political economies that figure European privilege and prosperity, and concomitantly the vulnerabilities of the Caribbean present as dimensions of the contemporary lives of colonial and slave histories. If in this analysis, colonial interests function like a silent virus crippling post-colonial futures, that can be seen as both the virus and its symptom, shaping the post-colonial world order while also being its product. The Haiti indemnity story is, is a synecdoche of that larger regime of world economic order built by colonialism and slavery. Imperial warships may not be as ostentatiously visible indicators of the conditions of recognition of every post-colonial state, but the rules for recognition are ever present. This regime of world order produced sovereign debt as a silent virus of decolonization, birthed and nurtured by that regime in ways that mutilated and fettered processes of political transition from colonialism and slavery through debt and dependence. The concept of odious debt is a transitional justice mechanism for precisely such situations. The idea of odious debt operates such that put upon political transition, debt obligations taken on by an odious regime are terminated. As Professor Jeff King of UCL itself notes, odious debt focuses on the purposes to which the debt has been undertaken. In that sense, it looks back at history. Robert House summarizes its basic principles. He says the odious debt concept seeks to provide a model and legal foundation for severing in whole or in part the continuity of legal obligations where the debt in question was contracted by a prior odious regime and was used in ways that were not beneficial or were harmful to the interests of the population. Close quotes. The core insight of the notion of odious debt is that the fact that a party submits to a contract is not proof of its validity. Rather, the validity of the contract should depend on the purposes to which the debt is used and basic principles of fair, equitable, and non-coercive conditions. The US invoked the doctrine in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War to argue that Cuba and the United States should not be held responsible for debts incurred by the colonial Spanish government. In the Haitian case, the argument is that the world economic order built by colonialism and slavery is the core sovereign of the post-colonial nation state. It is this odiously twinned regime that led to debts inimical to the interests of the local population. The purpose of the debt was to fatten the profits of slavery and empire. The coercive circumstances of national debt in the post-colony include coercion that is visible and coercion that is part of the background laws and institutions that cast their shadow on terms of debt negotiation. It includes the specter of warships on the horizon, as well as the laws and institutions of a racial capitalist economic order that sustain and reproduce systems of economic exploitation and vulnerability. Foregrounding these dimensions of post-colonial world order calls for reframing the notion of the odious regime to include both visible and less visible dimensions of global governance that structure how sovereigns acquire debt and negotiate its terms. How these dimensions are taken into account in defining what counts as an odious purpose emerges as a central dimension of how the doctrine is given force in assessing conditions for terminating debt obligations. If 1804 marked the freedom dreams of Haitian men and women leading to the first successful anti-slavery, uh, anti-colonial revolution, um, the 1825 recognition of Haiti as an already indebted sovereign nation is in many ways the origin story of post-colonial sovereignty. Midwifed into the world by the twin forces of freedom dreams and odious debt, the key foundation of post-colonial sovereignty is that shackling of freedom and duress. The call for reparations for the sovereign debt burden of post-colonial states seeks to render visible the pathologies that have been normalized into the shackling of freedom and duress to help render Jubilee thinkable within international law. This calls for rewriting debt as reparation um, is not a bookkeeping intuition. It is about a political intervention. There is a fundamental difference between framing it through the lens of debt forgiveness and framing it through the lens of odious debt. As House has written, the concept of odious debt is itself a reframing. 
it regroups a particular set of equitable considerations that have often been raised to adjust or severe debt obligations in the context of political transitions based on the perpetrated odiousness of the previous regime and the notion that the debt it incurred did not benefit or was used to repress the people, So sort of close quotes. In short, it is a concept that in the Haitian case enables a revisiting of 1825 in the spirit of 1804. 1825 cemented a compact whereby Haiti severed the radical aspirations of 1804, undertook a debt that not only impoverished Haiti and led to untold repression and hardship for its people, but it also legitimized French colonialism and slave holdings. CLL James has written that Toussaint knew that the society of nations was morally odious. New imperialists were, in James's words, for the insatiable gangsters that they were that there is no oath too sacred for them to break, no crime, deception, treachery, cruelty, destruction of human life and property, which they would not commit, uh, commit against those who would not defend themselves, James says. It is perhaps in that sense that Scott, uh, David Scott speaks to how in James's telling of what was at stake in the Haitian revolution was not just a legal rights of Haitians, but a revolution. When France formally renounced its claim to Haiti, but it recognized was a post-colonial sovereign state, not the revolution of 1804. Two scholarly commentators on odious debt, Jayachandran and Kramer, argue that the doctrine of odious debt relies on two basic observations. One, debt exacerbates dispossession and misery in countries that are already impoverished. And moreover, that the condition in which those contracts were undertaken were illegitimate. In a similar way, in an article titled Odious Rulers, Odious Debts, Joseph Stiglitz makes a compelling case for the illegitimacy of such a debt contract. He says, why should the Congolese be forced to repay Cold War loans made by Western countries to buy Mobutu's favor? Especially since the lenders knew full well that the money was either not to, uh, going not to the people of the country, but to Mobutu's Swiss bank accounts. Why should Ethiopians, uh, Stiglitz continues to say, have to repay the loans made to the Mendes to Red Terror regime? Loans that made it possible to buy the arms used to kill the very people whose friends and relatives must now repay the loans. Chileans today are still paying off debts incurred during the Pinochet years, and South Africans are still paying off those incurred under apartheid. Argentines are still repay, repaying the money that financed the dirty war in their countries from 1976 to 1983. Yet in many cases where invocation of the doctrine of odious debt has been seriously considered, post-apartheid South Africa, for instance, countries have been urged against it on the theory that reneging on debts will cast aspersions on, the, on their bona fides of the litter nation, that it will deter foreign investors looking to make an honest deal and inhibit integration into the international economic system. Rather, the policy edicts of multilateral institutions encourage continued debt servicing. There's even an historically third world friendly institution such as the UN Conference on Trade and Development um, encourage model debtor discipline as a default option with language strikingly resonant with notions of financial responsibility and capitalist discipline, which are routine dimensions of quotidian tutelage regarding compliant new liberal citizenship. The rewards of debt servicing undertaken by post-colonial sovereigns performing good financial citizenship is inclusion in the society of nations. It is a price of inclusion, near colonial debt bondage. As Mike Davis reminds us in a discussion of genocidal famines across the globe, millions died not outside the modern world system, but in the very process of being forcibly integrated into its economic and political structures. This question of integration into the dominant world order is what took me to the film Black Panther that is set in the world of Wakanda, a political society that has refused membership in the society of nations. Anthropologist Audra Simpson argues that there was something to be revealed that reveals itself at the point of refusal, a stance, a principle, a historical narrative. The opening sequence of Wakanda proves a historical, uh, provides a historical narrative to set the stage for the story of Black Panther and Wakanda's refusal. We learn about the tribes that settled Wakanda, how Wakanda thrived with collective ownership of vibranium and how to secure their prosperity. Wakanda's vow vowed to hide in plain sight to refuse visibility and keep the truth of their power from the outside world. In the context of our discussion, this refusal of visibility would mean rejecting the terms of the debt, choosing severance over recognition, perhaps choosing the legacy of 1804 over the legacy of 1825. In that opening sequence of the film, a protective invisibility shield rises around Wakanda as war and slavery unfold around it. 
perhaps in another part of the world, those warships sailed into Haitian waters in this very moment. Because the film says, even as Wakanda thrived, securely hidden within its secret barriers, the world around it descended further into chaos. What if the Haitian president, Jean-Pierre Boyer, was less desperate for political recognition from the metropole? What if he had determined that Haiti was not going to pay for recognition by the Society of Nations, but that the Haitian Revolution, all it stood for and all it achieved, would be its own kind of invisibility shield? For instance, built from the alchemy of refusal and self-reliance, such shields were erected by maroon communities whose strategic sensibility and political vision were pivotal to the Haitian Revolution. The radical critique that the prosperity of Wakanda offers to the Haiti CARICOM reparation story is that this is the road not taken, an exit from the dominant economic order. Wakanda is a counterfactual that is a reference point for reparations claims. Wakanda represents the local ownership of natural resources that were lost because of colonialism's possibly integration of the global south over centuries into the global capitalist economy of Euro-American empire. Walter Rodney narrated the shadow script against which Wakanda rises, the script that showed how Europe underdeveloped Africa, where integration into the global economy was effected and constituted by the double genocide of the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism with enduring legacies of political and cultural domination, fetters of sovereign debt bondage and dependence on brutal regimes of trade and aid. If as Mike Davis and Walter Rodney who say that it was this racial capitalist world order that brought on the tragedies of underdevelopment as we know it, then Wakanda, a country that prospered by hiding from the world serves as a control case proving Rodney's argument. They control the natural resources, develop their industries and view the world and history outside colonial filters. As development economist Samir Amin advised, they effectively delinked from the world system and have much to show for it. I'm not proposing delinking as a policy program, but I find the notion of delinking is a helpful heuristic in presenting an alternative political and economic imaginary of the future, to open the door to the possibility, in Amin's words, of alternative societal projects. In particular, I find potentially in, in inter interpreting the notion of delinking as a form of refusal, as developed in the work of Audra Simpson, in relation to how indigenous sovereignty gets ex exercised contested and sustained in relation to and despite of settler colonialism, and in the context of maroon communities in relation to and despite slave systems. Simpson explores the politics of refusal in the context of the Mohawk nation, where Mohawk sovereignty exercises agency in ongoing complex and profound ways, contorting itself into a fundamental space of romance recognition, even while circumscribed by settled, settler colonial American and Canadian nation states. Not reconciled to the established division of powers that may be visible from a constitutional analysis of native sovereignty, the expressions of sovereign agency she highlights have a fundamentally interrupted and interruptive capacity that upstage differ and complicate the jurisdiction of the Canadian and American state. The articulations of sovereign agency she describes for instance, in defining membership in ways that are discontinuous with how rights and territories are defined by the Canadian and American state or the constitutions uh, that represent belonging in those states um, are constitutive of the ongoing negotiation of what Simpson describes as nested sovereignty. Simultaneously, simultaneously riven and constituted by tensions and internal contradictions, the nested sovereignty of settler colonialism is a form of sovereignty that shackles freedom and duress anti-colonial freedom dreams and neo-colonial debt bondage. Indeed, the international debt regime within which Haitian sovereignty has been embedded has a family resemblance to the contours of settler colonialism and the ongoing negotiation for space within such regimes. The spaces of refusal of Mohawk sovereignty may or may not be accessible to Washington or Ottawa or be recognized by international laws indicators of sovereignty, such as exclusive control over a defined territory, for instance. But illegibility might be part of its power as a refusal of a contract that predicated recognition on compliance. As Twail scholars, amongst others, have argued, the rules for membership in the Society of Nations have embedded in them the very hierarchies and exclusions that make the quest for recognition a tragically self-defeating enterprise. <laughs> 
As we have discussed in relation to the Haitian case, the very norms, rules, and procedures for inclusion in the name of universality fetter aspirations for self-determination. If integration into the world system on exploitative terms was coerced by colonialism in the post-colonial era, neutral rules of recognition do their own work through a racial capitalist world system that invites inclusion as the inevitable articulation of self-determination. These derivative terms of membership that have marked the political horizon of anti-colonial projects, indebted as they are to imperial constructions of modernity, are a mark of the strength of imperial hegemony among political elites who agree to the terms of the international debt regime. It is in this sense that a politics of refusal stands in contradistinction to a politics of recognition. It is a strategic hiding from recognition. As with Wakanda, camouflage as a nation of impoverished herdsmen, encouraging misrecognition may be part of the story of survival. Eluding recognition is here a mark of sovereignty rather than its defeat. Debt has catalyzed its own history of refusal. And in that point of refusal, in each iteration, there was something, as Simpson says, that seemed to reveal itself. A political ethics of interrupting an unjust international order, a historical narrative about the legacies of colonialism, an economic argument about the conditions for development of vision of an alternative political future. And there is a long tradition of refusal of the dominant model economy regarding debt. For instance, the new International Economic Order Declaration and Program of Action catalyzed a large call for debt restructuring that inspired social movements and shaped multilateral institutions such as UNCTAD. This includes a 1985 call for a third world debt strike. A quarter century later, the Jubilee campaign calls for canceling debts and policies that did not exploit immediate needs through credit terms that entrenched long-term economic precarity. In the current moment, there's been a call in the wake of COVID for, debt, for a debt moratorium. Um, in 2019, stunningly, 64 countries around the world, half of them on the African continent, spent more money to service the external debt than on healthcare. The call says the governments in 125 low and middle income countries spent 10.7% of their revenue on public health, while they drained 12.2% on external debt payments. The international think tank, the Committee for the Abolition of Illegitimate Debt, has called for a citizen's audit of, sovereignty de of sovereign debt to trace who benefits and who loses in this way. This too is a form of refusal. Joseph Stiglitz has argued that IFI's um, default opposition to this form of refusal, um, the international financial institutions um, hostility to debt restricting and debt defaults, this default opposition advances the interests of those who prey on precarity and need, but being fundamentally inimical to the long-term economic interests of borrowers and non-speculative creditors. Drawing from the history of unpayable debts in many Latin American countries that exacerbated poverty, Stiglitz has argued that debt forgiveness and debt restructuring is a sensible economic strategy for all governments, benefiting debtors and creditors alike. Some economists argue that rather than bringing catastrophe, default episodes mark the beginning of economic recovery. This is a story told about Argentina and the story told about the road not taken by Greece. The possibility of a third world debt strike that Castro invoked in 1985 at the Continental Dialogue on Foreign Debt may be one expression of such overt collective refusal. The pot potential political work of such a call for debt severance is its fundamentally interrupted and interruptive capacity in relation to international economic governance. These histories of interruptive refusal and the staccato rhythm through which they are expressed from Aristide to CARICOM, NIEO to Castro's call for a debt strike frame debt severance as a form of refusal from being hailed as an international economic subject by international law, a hiding from recognition that renders a little subject ungovernable by the international economic order. In this way, debt severance is a reparations claim is not a measure of economic desperation, but an assertion that there is a hidden realm of odious purpose that is embedded into the routine of international uh, citizenship and good governance. Anticlimatically for the thread we have been pursuing here at the end of Black Panther, Wakanda issues delinking. Like President Jean-Pierre Boyer from 200 years ago, King T'Challa, the woefully disappointing hero of Black Panther, sought recognition from the metropole and membership in the ranks of cosmopolitan humanitarianism. Thus T'Challa ends his UN address with a redemptive nod to neoliberal globalization and the promise of multilateral agencies shaping trade and aid from the ghettos of Oakland to impoverished places of the planet the world over. If T'Challa's romance with recognition by the global elite is not without historical precedent, 
as Alkanat notes, Jean Price Maas, considered the intellectual godfather of negritude movements, accused the Haitian elite of practicing collective Bavarism, or a form of mass escapist daydreaming at the expense of the largely traditional African heritage population. Boerism sought recognition as Francophone rather than Afro-Caribbean with their own futures tied to the romance of global recognition. In closing now, let me return, however, to the interrupted and interruptive capacity of reparation claims in the register of odious debt. This is not a plea for debt forgiveness. Debt forgiveness implicitly legitimizes the underlying contract. In contrast, the doctrine of odious debt draws attention to how illegitimate purpose is built into international economic transactions based on enslavement, colonization, and exploitation directly or indirectly. Be it the international economic order of 200 years ago or the economic order of Bretton Woods that we are living with today. If debt forgiveness invests in a certain actuarial visibility, the doctrine of odious debt invests in a legal legibility. If the depression claims of Haiti were taken up in court, the doctrine of odious debt provides a legal hook for a friends of the a friends of the court brief, an amicus curiae. Let me conclude then with some reflections on legal argumentation, or what I would like to call recombinant legal argument, by building on the work of cultural theorists such as Mekebal and Saidi Hartman. At the core of a reparative claim is the status of the visible, and at the core of the legal claim about odious debt is a structure of the fabula. The fabula is what Saidi Hartman, following Baal, refers to as the building block of the narrative. In search of legal claims, stitch together doctrine and precedent, authorized interpretations and persuasive reinterpretations. With the hum of social movements and socioeconomic transformation as impetus and inspiration, amendment and reannotation are the building blocks of legal change. Legal concepts that were once errant and marginal may move to center stage, settled interpretations may be rendered doctrinaire and out of date. This process can yield legal arguments that are innovative composites of the settled and the unsettling in ways that have resonance with what has been termed recombinant narratives. Hartman speaks to historical narrative that calls for a reconsideration of received interpretations by drawing attention to the essentially contested nation of the uh, nature of the fabula and the narratives that provide their scaffolding. Her method of critical fabulation describes how we might engulf authorized speech in the clash of voices and the ways in which she has tried to work with the archive to make visible the production of disposable lives. It is a project that requires listening generously for the fabula, imagining it differently, and then narrating it by rearranging, she says, the basic elements of the story. This mode of bearing witness is part of what dissident lawyering entails in formulating and advancing the doctrine of odious death. Just as Hartman's history works with and against the archive, the legal argument for rewriting sovereign debt as reparations is working with and against law. A heretical imagination and the invocation and rearrangement of basic legal concepts of contract and equity emerges equally central to thinking about recombinant legal narratives that can contribute to a politics of refusal. From Santo Domingo to Wakanda, the life of slavery and revolution, of legal claims about odious debts and political briefs for delinking, these are all at the same time, both a recording and a speculation about what happened, what might have happened, in ways that open up what could happen. If the current world order continues to hurtle Haiti and, CARICOM, and the CARICOM world further into a long night of atrocity, the repression claims and the story it narrates about how that world functions is like a modern Shahanaze tale, both true in its wisdom and fanciful in its ambitions, magical in its idealism and realist in its account of the lives and futures at stake. In drawing attention to the fact that we are all witnesses to atrocity, it seeks to forestall the futures that have condemned the formerly enslaved and colonized and redirect our vision to an alternative dawn. This repertory vision interrupts the necropolitical abyss that is built into the logic of the international system through yet another story and makes such alternatives seeable by the eyes of the law. In this, it follows previous storytelling interventions in nights past by Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Paul Aristide, and others yet to follow in the coming nights. Let me end there. Thank you so very much, Vasuki, for such a wonderfully rich, uh, nuanced, and insightful treatment of such an important topic. Thank you. Can I now ask those of you attending live to post any questions or comments you might have in the Q&A section of Zoom? And I'll put these to Vasuki in the time that we have left between now and the end of the hour. I'll perhaps, while people are doing that, um, uh, um, 
start with one myself, Vasuki. So, um, in your presentation, in your in your work, you 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 conceptualize an uh, an, an idea, of, uh, invoke an idea of of Ill what sometimes you refer to as illegitimate debt, of odious debt. Of course, understood in the context of your idea of of hiding from recognition. Of course, one thinks of Frantz Fanon as part of the established normative and political regime globally. So hiding from and challenging the very rules, as you call them, the rules that, that as you've characterized them, rules that fetter self-determination. I wanted to ask you whether though this, these concepts imply, necessarily have to imply some sort of idea of certain other forms of debt that might be legitimate. And and um, and if so, is it, are the concepts still ones that to, to to a certain extent buy into certain underlying ideas, notably economic ones, which one might wish to challenge in other contexts, and indeed even in this context. Um, sure, and a great great question. I mean, I think of this, you know, in some sense, odious debt is not, I mean, that's partly why I think of it um, as a sort of as, as provisional, as provisional claim rather than a propositional claim. It is not a claim, it is not a claim about, um, about debt or even um, as a, as a way of defining, you know, what is, you know, a legitimate contract. It is instead, in some sense, a political move, a strategic political intervention, um, which is, um, entailed in some sense, which is, you know, sometimes catalyzed by the by the circumstances of sovereign debt um, today. Um, that doesn't mean that it may not have other kinds of consequences, including ones that are deemed um, uh, 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 deemed legitimate. I mean, I think it, in some sense, it, um, it it cannot be a theory that is transhistorical. And I think in every particular context, one has to make the claim. And I use Haiti as an example because it's particularly vivid in some sense with uh, what happened in, um, in 1825, but I'd see it as you know, just a, the, the grain of sand through which we understand what the, the, the conditions of, um, the, of, of the global south or the post colony in some sense more, more generally. Um, so, um, so in that sense, it's I think up to each intervention to recombine these um, uh, the, the fabula in ways that um, that, that make a persuasive um, persuasive argument. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so now we have a a question from uh, my uh, wonderful co-host for these uh, events, Alonso Gomendi Dunkelberg, who will be with uh, you all as host of the next uh, lecture. So Alonso asks, and I'm I'm reading this from the Q and A. In the past, odious debt could end up leading to armed intervention. There were many efforts led to decouple the two. Would you say that the prohibition on coercive collection of debt has entrenched the concept of debt and made us talk about it less in the developing world, made us, us in the developing world talk about it less? Um, Alonso asks, why are developing nations no longer making odious debt one of their main talking points at the UN? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, you know, I am, um, yeah, it, it is a, a question that I have as well <laughs> about, you know, why, why, for instance, CARICOM um, hasn't uh, framed some of their arguments um, in this mode. Um, and I think, you know, partly, of course, that the international community um, has been um, so hostile to the notion of ODS debt um, and has been so, um, um, you know, as there's such a basic investment in uh, in in um, notions of uh, in, in a depoliticized notion of um, contract um, and saving private order um, that uh, and there's so many powerful actors involved with it, even in the most extraordinary circumstances like Haiti or you know or like even in the context of COVID, you would think that this crisis. Would let would would sort of be an opening that would um, allow people to um, um, be able to you know um, relax uh, or have a moratorium on debt, you know, but nevertheless safeguard their uh, mm -hmm. even the even the most uh, uh, nefarious actors safeguard their interests by saying it's a crisis or it's an emergency or an exception. But even in this context, 
there has been reluctance to um, 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 uh, let go. So um, yeah, I mean, I think you know the uh, the, the bad guys don't give an inch. <laughs> so um, and 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 so I think it has to be a question of broader struggle. And I think you know one definitely you know the I th the 1985 you know when Castro called for a third world death strike, it went to the heart of what would make something like like this possible: um, a collective action. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, we now have a question, and of course, it's it, it's uh, 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 as it were an, an occupational hazard um, uh, working on this topic that people will throw in questions in, implicating uh, uh, broader, very fundamental issues that that maybe you didn't touch upon, but relate to your talk. So uh, one question here is is a, a very broad question. Some people say there is no amount of money that can make up for the atrocities of slavery. What is your opinion of this? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that's why I think of it. You know, I want I made the distinction early on between the notion of reparations uh, in the human rights regime, where the, there's often people say, okay, it's not for closure and it's not, um, and you know, you 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 cannot fully think, but there is certainly an idea that you pay reparations um, and then you move on. Um, and um, I think I, I completely agree that I think there is there is no money for to make that can make up for the truth of slavery or many other atrocities. And in fact, this is one opening of the conversation. In many ways, I think it's a way thinking of reparations. Um, I think the value of reparations is a reminder that slavery is not something that was there 200 years ago, but slavery is present with us today in terms of the world that slavery made. Um, and so, um, and it's not, you know, paying money is not going to end that world. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think I'm, I'm totally with you, but so. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, uh, the questioner wanted to ask about the distinction between Afrofuturism, as in Black Panther, the film, and what Enedi Okorofo named African Futurism, situate, which situates its imaginaries in an African, not a diaspora context. Um, and one of the distinctions is whether law becomes a dispossessor, as in Afrofuturism, Afro or, and, uh, and here um, our, our questioner is, is quoting um, uh, Somali ambassador Yusuf Duala to the General Assembly in 1958. So whether law becomes a dispossessor, Afrofuturism, Afro or, and the quote is, a means of ending strife and tension, not as a means of creating it. So in, in your, end of quote, in your imaginary, does the use of law lead to conflict or resolve it? Well, I think law is itself conflict ridden um, and it's not rather than something that's sort of managing conflict from the outside um, or escaping conflict um, by stepping aside. Um, so I think, you know, law on the one hand, you know, has been um, implicated in all of these kinds of, in, in all of these dispossessions that you, um, uh, the, uh, uh, that you highlight, whether um, at, di very, at different scales, um, you know, whether it's talking about the region, uh, African region, or whether it's talking about the African diaspora, um, whether it's, you know, material dispossession or sort of epistemic dispossession of a particular kind, uh, or at least epistemic capital in relation to uh, the, uh, dispossession of a different kind. Um, I think law is involved in, has been involved in all of those. But I think I am, you know, perhaps, you know, in contrast to um, perhaps a, a more pessimistic perspective, I am also arguing for not giving up on law. So that law is part of the struggle and it's both to be condemned and um, to be used when we can. So that's my argument towards the end of my paper about recombinant legal narratives is in some sense to think of law, I mean, it's an old critical legal studies insight about the indeterminacy of law, even though the structural bias is overwhelming. Uh, that we should fight for it, and we should we should use not fight for law, but use fight uh, use law for whatever other political goals that we may have, and therefore we should think in, um, innovatively um, around questions like reparations and um, and um, uh, and and odious debt without um, being paralyzed by the view that this will make us complicit in a conservative legal regime, um, which the legal regime undoubtedly is. Great, thank you. Um, and um, the next question uh, is uh, asking about um, the issue of elitism. 
Um, uh, so I'm reading the question out now. So with respect to the potential for reparation um, in, in respect to post-colonial states that have been historically governed by actors that were or are acting in the interest of the previous colonizer, um, and in today's Global South, um, and this question gives a purported example of this, um, should the potential reparations um, approach also include non-state actors um, that could be acting in the interest of the general majority of the population more than perhaps the leaders of the current leaders of those um, countries? Um, should agreement on reparation include conditions to ensure that the majority predominantly subaltern actors uh, be the beneficiaries of the reparation? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I agree with the spirit of the question. Um, my, I was not proposing a reparations program, so in that sense, there's no, I'm not actually distributing reparations in any particular way, but I, um, I think I agree with the spirit of the question that often states, um, as with Haiti in 1824, um, are not the best representatives of the Haitian revolution. Um, and they were representing the interests of a state that wanted a particular kind of legitimacy and an elite that could most benefit from from that legitimacy. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I'm um, completely with you that in some sense, we need to think about social movements and transnational solidarities in ways that are much more, um, um, that, 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 you know, think beyond the, uh, the, the political horizon of the nation state and our formal representatives um, who have often, um, you know, um, uh, of, of, often um, um, had find, found common cause with, with precisely the rules of oppression. In fact, that's, I think, part of the origin of the concept of odious death, that precisely that recognition that there is a tension, that there is a often a fundamental contradiction between, um, between people who contract debt in the name of the people and the people themselves. Great, thank you, uh, Vasuki. So I should probably uh, draw things to a close. Um, I, I want to begin by thanking you, Vasuki, so very much for starting our series off so fantastically well. I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to you. Um, and everyone um, uh, attending and, and watching the recorded version of this, um, if you wish to read more um, on, uh, of Vasuki's uh, work on this subject, I draw your attention to a forthcoming article entitled um, A Double Take on Debt, uh, Reparations, Claims and Regimes of Visibility in a Politics of Refusal, which is scheduled for publication uh, with the Osgood Hall uh, Law Journal. Our next uh, lecture is entitled uh, Decolonizing the Construction of Knowledge, editing a handbook on international law of the Americas and will be delivered by the wonderful Liliana Obregón of the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. That will be on the 1st of November. And my colleague Alonso Gomendi Dunkelberg will be the host then. Um, in the meantime, many thanks again, uh, Vasuki. I'm so grateful to you. Um, and all my very best wishes and thanks to everyone uh, watching. And thank you again uh, to my wonderful colleague, uh, Lisa Penfold, who has been in the background um, enabling this uh, lecture to happen. Goodbye. Right. Thanks, Ralph. And thanks again, Lisa.